Thank you both for coming. The Columbian is pleased to welcome candidates for state representative from 18th District, position two. I think I have that right. Um, I'm Greg Jane, uh, editorial page editor, and I believe you met the other members of the editorial board. Just so you know, uh, reporter Jake Thomas is sitting in on this meeting. He won't be asking questions here, but might want to speak with you later. Uh, we are videotaping this. We will post it unedited on our website for the benefit of our, our readers. And just for clarification, uh, you are running for the seat currently held by Liz Pike, who is not seeking re-election. Yes, sir. So um, should be interesting without an incumbent in the race. And we'll get started. Uh, it take one to two minutes to introduce yourselves, explain why you're running, and then we'll move on to specific policy questions. And we'll start with Larry. My name is Larry Hoff. I'm running for the State House of Representatives from the 18th District, Position 2. Um, by way of introduction, I'm, I'm originally from North Dakota, from a small farming town there. I graduated from high school, spent four years in the Navy, finished my degree in accounting, and came west. Uh, that was 1977. I worked at a small uh, I guess not so small family business, construction business for a few years. Then applied for a job at a credit union. That our office was just down the street here. Uh, it doesn't happen to be there anymore. They moved their main office. That was Columbia Credit Union uh, in 1982. Uh, and 35 years later, I retired from the credit union industry. Uh, the the reasons I'm running are, are vast, and that, and actually, it, it they kind of fall back on what I did in my career. I, I was a I ended up as the interim CEO at Columbia Credit Union, and then the, uh, just retired from the from Fiber Federal Credit Union as the CEO. And for 35 years, I've just been helping people with their finances, uh, taking a look at their budgets, um, helping small businesses with some of the regulatory burden, trying to figure out when they can be successful and when they can't. Um, but initially, just just needed to get back into the um, uh, process of helping people after I retired in 2017. Um, another aspect of why I'm running is what I believe in. I believe in civility. I think, um, I think for way too long our politics have been too divisive. Uh, and I've been, uh, I've worked hard in the credit union industry to eliminate the, uh, the essence of aisle when I went to the legislature. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that as an elected representative. Quick question, Larry, do you, have you run for office before? No, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? Sure, so I'm Kathy Gillespie, uh, running for the State House of Representatives in the 18th District, position two. I also ran for the seat in 2016. I challenged Lynn, Liz Pike, the incumbent, excuse me. I wasn't successful in that race, but I think I knew I'd always come back in 2018. Uh, just finished up eight years on the Vancouver School District Board of Directors, elected twice uh, to oversee about a $300 million budget, uh, 3,200 employees, 23,000 students, and somewhere around 35 programs and buildings. Um, I was very pleased with our primary win that we just had a few weeks ago. I think the voters recognized my experience in public policy and budget oversight and in working with constituents to really make sure that our government agencies deliver the tangible results that they expect. I think the results show that voters uh, you know, ex uh, respect that experience and they appreciate the energy that I've shown in the campaign. We actually started this campaign last summer, so at, at the end, I'll have been campaigning for 15 months. Uh, when I finished my two terms on the school board, I opted not to go back into the business world, but instead devote myself to this campaign 100% uh, of the time. So we've had the privilege of being out on the doors with voters um, every day since February. And I think that's given me, um, you know, even more insight to what uh, citizens and taxpayers expect out of government, which is uh, first and foremost respect for the money that they send uh, through their taxes, uh, tangible results, um, and pursuit of the goals that we share as a state. 
So, you know, the things that I'm really focused on, uh, some of it's an extension of my work on the school board, which really focused on transparency and accountability. So I was a big champion for taking some of those backroom deals, some of those things that are kind of done and then just rubber stamped in the public um, and shining a light on those to help, um, I think, governance perform better. So when, when citizens know more, they come with better questions and we deliver better policy. Uh, so that's something I'll be wanting to bring up to the legislature and I think they really need um, some help with that because they view themselves as being above transparency and I certainly don't agree. Um, for me, everything is, is about raising Southwest Washington's profile uh, to, as a counterweight to the Portland metropolitan area and also to the Puget Sound. We want to make sure that Southwest Washington gets its fair share to fund the infrastructure pro uh, programs here, our workforce development programs to bring more jobs here. So, you know, the job is to be a champion of the people, to represent our interests, and to deliver results. And so I'm, I'm just really happy to be here and have an opportunity to talk with you. Great. Thank you. Um, there are many issues we want to get to, but uh, let's start with one of the, the major issues in the sure. legislature in recent years has been school funding in the wake of the McClary uh, decision. What are your thoughts about the final solution that the legislature came up with and how they went about getting there and where we should go from here. Let's start with Larry. Well, the, the final solution was was crafted over a number of years in the legislature. Um, it was vetted through the Supreme Court, uh, analyzed and vetted through the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. I believe we need to uh, let the final solution play. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, there's a lot of discussion now about should we tweak this, should we change that? Well, it, the plan really hasn't taken off at this point, so I, I, I believe we need to uh, allow it to take hold um, and then make course corrections. Have the administrators come and talk to the legislature, listen to the teachers, uh, learn from their experiences, listen to the administrators, understand that the plan has to really uh, be implemented should be implemented prior to making dramatic changes, but uh, uh, in any case, I, I'm excited to see it work. Kathy? So, uh, the McCleary case has been closed, and I, I agree with that. The legislature did fulfill the Supreme Court's uh, request that they uh, eliminate uh, local dollars to local levies to be used for basic education expenses. And I, I agree with their um, findings. So that's behind us. What's left in its wake were a number of reforms that also came with the funding. And I think that you asked, you know, how do, I think you asked a little bit about my impressions of how they got where they got. And so um, I have been critical, and I think most um, education advocates and certainly I think citizens are right to be critical of the manner in which they crafted the final bill. Uh, on the eve of a fourth special session, government shut down. Um, the bill arrives near midnight and next morning uh, legislators um, say yay or nay. And did they read the bill? I'm not sure. Um, so I think last minute policy making largely out of the public eye is is not the best way to make policy, but that, that's what happened. So uh, the four major reforms that came down, and, and there may have been more, but I think of it as, as four big areas. Um, I think we're starting to see some cracks in those reforms, which were actually forecast by education advocates, some legislators, and other uh, people in public policy who have a deep understanding of school financing. Um, you know, they indicated that the local levy, uh, changes to the local levies, the caps, the regionalization of teacher pay, the staff mix changes, um, special education funding. Some of the things they saw going down the pipeline, they predicted that some of those would have a problem. I think we're, now that districts are unpacking, all the rules and regulations and OSPI has given their analysis, we're starting to see that there are some areas that probably do need tweaks because instead of um, evening out the inequities, it's exacerbating inequities. And we're not as 
uh, Larry said, um, isn't it too soon to tell those things? We have predictions and analyses, but shouldn't we let it play out and see how it actually works? Yeah, so right now we have every district has the pivot tables and the data analysis provided by OSPI and from their own um, fiscal managers that show pretty clearly, uh, and there's no debate really among legislators right now that, I would say the majority of legislators, that certain pots of money were bigger in your district than in my district. And I'm not talking about teacher salaries. I'm just talking about the fundamental ways that we fund basic education. Um, so I think that certainly we want to hear more from our advocates and our uh, professional staff in our business offices and OSPI to show us where the inequities are. But I don't think there's disagreement that inequities exist. The question is, um, what can be done about them? What's the practical effect on an individual student's experience in Eastern Washington and Western Washington? Uh, because of course the mandate is ample education, you know, equal education for all. Um, so we just want to unpack that and make sure your experience in Lake Chelan is the same as my experience uh, on Bainbridge Island. Now, uh, Larry, what do you think about what Kathy said uh, regarding the process that the legislature came up with this? Was that adequate? Would you do it differently? Well, the, the process had a partisan tinge to it, uh, and, and yet it was developed in a nonpartisan way, and yet the, the final um, funding of the additional uh, well, kind of amount that went to the districts was a partisan vote. I agree with Kathy. I think that was, uh, that shouldn't have been. It should have been more of a collaborative issue or, or process, uh, one that I think that's where I can, you know, kind of add to this kind of this equation, for, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, Kathy's spot on, and of course, Kathy's been on the school board for you know, eight years. It would be hard for me to go uh, tit for tat uh, in, a, <laughs> in an education sense. And, uh, and yet, it, it, um, uh, I, <clears throat> some of the adjustments are going to be made. They're going to have to be made. Uh, but again, I think it's way too early to decide what those are. I, I think we need to let the plan start, um, and then again, listen to the administrators, listen to school board folks, uh, listen to the teachers, and, and uh, see where those inequities lie. Okay. Um, let's move on to uh, transportation. Uh, Interstate 5 Bridge also has been a frequent topic. First of all, what would be your preference? Do you prefer fixing the I-5 Bridge, replacing the I-5 Bridge, or would you prefer a third bridge, either east or west? And what role should the legis legislature play in helping this get there? Let's start with Kathy. So I think we're in the midst of a very um, unifying effort to uh, demonstrate broad consensus and acceptance of the idea that the I-5 corridor is our number one corridor. And, you know, uh, as a legislator, certainly want to listen to our courts, to our businesses, to our elected leaders, uh, the county level and cities, um, and they're all coalescing around this idea that the I-5 corridor is of primary importance, and so certainly I agree with that. Um, the idea of a third or fourth bridge, I think, is intriguing at some future point, but I'm not aware, with the exception of one legislator in Oregon, uh, that there's anyone to receive that pitch. So uh, I think we can line up along the Columbia River on our side and throw the ball over, and if no one's there to catch that third or fourth bridge, it's not happening. Uh, so I think those discussions right now are counterproductive. Uh, but we always want to be visionary and looking toward the future and delivering maximum value for our people. So at some point, you know, that those a third and a fourth bridge might might answer that. But for now, I think our number one priority is replacing the I five bridge as soon as possible. And I'm really glad that they're repairing relationships. I'm glad that Peter Courtney has 
uh, signaled that he's very happy that the uh, marriage is being repaired, so to speak, and I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic that we're going to um, get this done sooner than later. I think the legislative role is not only to authorize the funding, to, but to be the number one cheerleaders for this project. Anytime the bridge is being discussed, uh, whether it's at Labor Roundtable or the Clark County Transit, you know, what, whatever the venue is, it would be ideal if a legislator was there to cheer the project, to witness the discussion, and to uh, remind people of the vital importance of this, uh, this artery. It's just critical to our success, and I think we should be there with pom-poms and cheering things on. Uh, Larry, what are your thoughts between I-5 versus the third or fourth bridge? Well, I, first of all, we've messed up 20 years ago. I mean, we're talking about a problem today that should, we shouldn't be talking about. Um, we need visionaries in Olympia that aren't afraid to make those bigger decisions. So coming back to the I-5 bridge, we either need to fix it or replace it. There's no question about that. The problem with that is it doesn't solve a lot of congestion issues. I mean, unless we have more lanes or wider lanes or, or we take care of the bottlenecks in Oregon, uh, the bridge will merely be um, uh, a, a very good-looking new uh, uh, bridge. Um, the, the issue that uh, I think is embedded in your question it has to do with you know, some mass transit issues. Well, we, we need to include those. Uh, that's going to help congestion at, at least somewhat. Uh, but our world, you guys know, uh, people love their cars. We can't get people out of their cars, so we have to need. We need to project that into ten years and twenty years, and that means a different thoroughfare, a different, more capacity, a different bridge. Um, Would you support light rail on the I five bridge? No. Would you support bus rapid transit? What would be your solution? I'm a bigger fan of bus rapid transit based on its flexibility. Um, we aren't tied to the rails uh, necessarily. Uh, but that aside, that, that's just one part of the congestion issue. Um, how, we, how we really take a look at the, the thoroughfares, the access, the, um, the on-ramps, the off-ramp access, uh, I think it's all tied in. And we need to be thinking about that um, in, a, in a futuristic sense, as opposed to solving this problem and leaving the, the real problem for somebody else. So are you calling for a new freeway corridor through the Vancouver area? And if so, how far down the line would that be? 20 years. I mean, am I calling for a new freeway corridor? Yeah, a new Interstate 605. There has like to that. be some, if, if indeed we have another bridge, uh, just putting a bridge over the Columbia River isn't going to do us any good. Um, we'll have to have some sort of connection, uh, some additional thoroughfare uh, capability. So I don't, I don't have that magic bullet. Uh, I don't, and I imagine it's going to take a lot of uh, uh, studying. It's got, uh, it's got implications of land ownership and uh, and river access and all kinds of things. But it's, it's time we think about that. And and actually, the legislative group put together has that as one of their challenges. Uh, their priority is the I-5 uh, bridge. But their second charge is to make sure that they start thinking about uh, another access. And legislators uh, have been at some of these Washington or Oregon uh, ODOT meetings, uh, mostly now, though, to pull the flag up and say, throw that tolling issue away. Uh, that was their challenge there. So, so just a quick follow-up. Um, you mentioned that we messed up 20 years ago or regarding the bridge. Just briefly tell me. What I don't think we had. I don't think there were enough people really looking at the vision of the of the crossing and, and how our uh, how our community would grow, uh, what expansion really meant. Um, uh, if indeed we have the best place to live in the state, which I would have to agree on, what does that mean? Are people going to flood in here? If indeed they flood in, do we still just get get by with a couple of crossings on the river? So I. I I, I believe um, 
messed up is a uh, is kind of a uh, an indication of the fact that I wasn't there. <laughs> but that aside, it it I, I believe we we should have been thinking about that a little bit earlier, and maybe we were. Uh, maybe it got voted down in some legislative backroom deal, um, but in any case, right now is the time to think about the third bridge, the fourth bridge, a different crossing. Now, five years ago, would you have voted for the CRC as it was proposed? No, because it included light rail. Okay. Um, Kathy, would you have voted for the CRC as it was? You know, I don't know that I, I would have. Um, before giving you a definitive answer, I would really, you know, want to be as responsible as possible and really be, you know, with all the data and information. Certainly, I know that there were people who were bitterly dis disappointed when that didn't go through, and there were people cheering mm -hmm. uh, its demise. I think that for the people who were cheering its demise, um, if they could have seen where we are now and how far we are from any kind of funding solution, any kind of plan, and putting this uh, marriage back together. You know, I, I mean, I just I just wonder. So I think um, I no, wish that know. we had a bridge right now, let me say that, that the people uh, could afford, that we felt was right for us, and we were, you know, looking to those next solutions. You know, and I don't think the marriage, I, 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 I agree with Kathy in that it needs to be uh, the relationship between Oregon and Washington needs to be uh, kind of cultivated, but I don't, I don't think it's dead by any means. I, and uh, Kathy mentioned uh, Senator Courtney. You know, there, there are still people that understand that it's as much of a challenge for Oregon as it is for Washington. We just need to get over whatever pain there was in the past and come to the table and talk about these differences. It doesn't matter um, who's got the right idea as long as it's a good idea uh, we should get over that that ownership problem uh, and i i think that can happen and just to clarify uh, uh, would you support light rail on any new proposal that comes up i think the sweet spot is to bring the bus rapid transit on and make ourselves ready to expand if light rail becomes something that our population density um, will allow for um, I, I, you know, I don't think you, when you're doing that kind of a big infrastructure project and you really are dreaming big and looking into the future and being responsible with taxpayer dollars, you, you don't want to close any doors unnecessarily. Uh, so hopefully we can leave more doors open than we close and still deliver the right project at the right price uh, given where we are right now. I hope that's possible. Larry, could you go for something like that, make the bridge light, wa light rail ready, or are you dead set against light rail? The studies I've seen and uh, just suggest that light rail doesn't, uh, doesn't pay for itself uh, in any regard. Um, I understand the connection. I understand that, that it would be a handy um, you know, alternative to mass transit. I just, I just don't think it's going to be cost effective. I think there's a uh, there's an opportunity to expand BRT uh, and uh, take that into all areas within the Portland metro area, uh, as well as Vancouver, and uh, make that work uh, to the best of its ability. How many lanes should the uh, interstate bridge have? One more every afternoon. <laughs> just one. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I don't know that I, I'd have, have the information enough to answer that. More is the answer. Uh, and what, what's your understanding of how many lanes was proposed under the CRC? I don't believe there was an extra lane. I don't, I actually don't recall that. But I, I do know that it didn't cut down the traffic, uh, the traffic congestion dramatically. You know, the, the three sits in my mind, but it could have been as many as five. I'm not sure. You know, there's someone I respect very much up in Ridgefield who said, by the way, we don't have three lanes right now. We don't have shoulders. And those lanes are incredibly narrow. And the problem is that on-ramp, when you're going southbound, and the off-ramp. So he said, he said to me, when you have three real lanes at the appropriate width with appropriate shoulders, um, 
it's going to look a lot different. So, you know, when people say, well, three lanes, it has three lanes now. Well, they're really not in terms of highway standards. That's my understanding. I'm not an expert. Um, is, is that it would look vastly different. The roadway would be much wider once we put those shoulders in in the appropriate way. But now I don't remember, and that's a good Jeopardy question. Well, what's, what's the answer? <laughs> I believe it's five plus. I think yeah. Plus. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought so. Uh, five actual lanes with a shoulder, with a, a, a BRT lane that uh, might be a BRT lane or it might be light rail. So that gives you a 100% increase in the capacity. Yeah, so great. we had three lanes coming into five going across the bridge and dumping into that's, three other lanes. That's true. Because we had the problem with the road supporter. Right. There's a number of other bottlenecks, but transportation people now generally feel like you've got to solve these bottlenecks one at a time. You can't take them all down simultaneously. Right. And I think there is, you know, it's my understanding that Oregon does understand that they have a problem at the road supporter. And they, they want to fix it. So I think it's time for us to, um, you know, uh, shake hands and seal the deal and really work together to address this corridor and for us to have as much influence as possible in helping them really see that that really needs to be improved and what can we do to help. I'm not talking about money, but just being a cheerleader for, for the corridor as a whole. Uh, that's going to be in the best interest of our taxpayers and our commuters, and I think it's in the best interest of Oregon as well. So, you know, I, I, I do think most people operating at the highest levels understand this is a system solution that may come in stages. Um, it's just really important that we commit to the work and get going. Oregon wants to fix their roads with Washington's money. Just say, what do you think about that? I don't. I think it's the very poorly conceived uh, idea. So if you're in the legislature, what do you do about it? Well, you sit down with the Oregon folks and have that discussion with them, and I'm sure that has gone on as we speak. Uh, and yet, it, it, I don't believe they understand the impact of 70,000 people crossing the bridge every day. Uh, Washington is paying their income tax, uh, and, uh, and then being told on top of that. So I, that's a touchy discussion, one that needs to be uh, held between adults uh, and just talk about the options that they may have or may, they may use to correct their transportation problems. Mm -hmm. Kathy, your thoughts about the tolling? Uh, so their congestion pricing on their side, I think that, um, I think if, if, as a legislator I would say tell me more. Um, and really trying to understand where they're coming from and then determine what hammer uh, Washington can bring to that discussion. Um, if kind of reasonable discussions around if our commuters are going to be told they're already paying income tax, is that going to benefit them? Do they get any kind of break? I mean, we want to go into it as if it's a negotiation, even though it's not up to Washington whether or not Oregon decides to do that. Now, I do think this is a little bit of a shiny ball uh, because it does require, as far as I'm aware, federal approval. Um, and I really don't see the federal government um, being able to make that decision anytime soon. Um, but in the case that it would, let's assume that it, that it could happen, that it is going to happen, the number one job of any legislator in the state of Washington is to protect Washington citizens and to minimize any impacts to maximize any benefits and to use every tool we have at our disposal to do that, including a few possible, um, I wouldn't say threats, that's a very strong word, uh, a few possible consequences of what we would consider to be an unfair action. Um, so maybe uh, doing something with the sales tax exemption over here, maybe suggesting that it's not a good idea that our um, uh, taxpayers that our citizens pay taxes over there for working over there like I did for all the years that I worked over there. So I think we need to know what's in the toolbox and then kind of bring bring our game to the conversation so to speak and try to get the best deal we possibly can but, but try and head it off. Uh, Finding levers I think is important. I don't think I'd mess with the sales tax exemption. That would hurt our small businesses. Uh, that wouldn't be my vote. 
think you always put something out there and you need to be raised a step back from it, but the point is made. Um, we're not here just to open our wallets for whatever you decide. Uh, when, whenever you decide we should open them uh, without knowing what we're getting in return. So. Larry, if you, if you would be reluctant to mess with the sales tax exemption, what suggestions would you have? In regard to a lever? Yeah. Um, I think it just, I think it's a common sense discussion between legislators. I don't know that there necessarily needs to be um, a, a stick held out here. Um, their, their, Oregon has some transportation challenges that they need to recognize. Whether or not we suggest we're going to take away the, the Oregonian sales tax advantage, uh, I don't think that does anything for us. It, it becomes a discussion between uh, two legislatures that are supposed to, that are blood brothers, blood sisters, uh, based on location, uh, that need to just figure out the right answer. You know, when this comes up out in public, I like to let people know, because I think a lot of citizens don't know, but I'm sure all of you do, that um, Washington State right now is piloting the road usage charge, um, whereby we recognize that gas tax revenues are falling as cars become more efficient, or people ride share, whatever the circumstance is, and that we've got to replace that revenue so that we can repair our roads. So charging per mile, um, is something that Washington right now is testing, and I, I'm actually one of those testing drivers. I'm doing it the low-tech way, taking a picture of my odometer reading, sending it to the state, and then I get an invoice back of what my usage of the road costs me. And so I think many people are aware of the tolling that's going on in the Puget Sound, but they're not necessarily aware of that road usage charge. So this is a model we may be moving toward. Um, you know, in a stronger way, and I think it's good for people to start warming up to that discussion and asking questions and advancing their interests in that discussion. From what you know so far, would you support that change? You know, for me, because I, I, I mean, personally, it looks like it, I have an advantage. I don't drive that many miles, at least right now, and I drive a hybrid, so I don't, you know. Um, I think, you know, in all these things, we've got to look at the data and the evidence, and most importantly, what are the goals? So if we make this change, what, what's the goal? Um, is it to have more money for infrastructure? Is it to um, make sure that if I'm a heavy user of the road, I'm paying my fair share? What's the impact on citizens? So I think we really have to understand all those pieces. And right now, I'm just a guinea pig uh, helping them out with their data. Hey, Larry, would you, do you think you would support a change to the gas tax? How should we? adjust to changing reality? Obviously, I'd need to learn more about the, the road usage fee. But I, um, if indeed um, uh, some method of, of a user fee would, would offset a different tax that, that everybody pays, there might be some validity to that. Right off the cuff, I, I'm not sure I'd be in favor of the road use uh, fee, but um, I'm excited to learn more about it. Well, like Kathy said, it's currently a pilot program, yeah. mm -hmm. so they're just sure. gleaning information from that. Um, let's uh, move on. Uh, next topic. I, I'm curious, uh, Larry, in your campaign material, um, you stress protection from the Second Amendment. Yeah. Um, first question, let's approach it from this regard. Do you think that we have a problem with gun violence in this country? Do I think we have a problem with gun violence? Mm -hmm. I don't think guns make the violence. Okay. Uh, it's, not an, it's not a gun thing. Uh, it's a, there's a variety of causes that, uh, that take people to the point of them pulling a trigger on innocent citizens. So, it has nothing to do with the gun, in my estimation. Um, as this question morphs into uh, uh, other kind of gun control uh, topics, I, um, the people that we need to protect are, the, are by far the ones that are the most innocent, our school children. Uh, I'd be in favor of, of uh, hardening the schools dramatically more than they are now. Uh, and what does that mean? 
Does that mean metal detectors? Does that mean fences? Does that mean moats? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I know that they can be hardened. I know that coming into a business, uh, a lot of businesses have more safety controls than our schools do. I, I'm a big fan of hardening them. I am not a fan of suggesting that, that a gun is the issue. What, what do you think would be the best way to harden the schools? Oh gosh, uh, secure the entrance and exits. Mm -hmm. um, right now, Columbia River has outside ex uh, entrances to their classrooms. Um, I'm not entirely sure if they've locked those permanently or not, but I know when my son was going to school there, um, I could walk in any classroom. How do you feel about that. teachers with guns? I struggle with that one. Uh, and only because I know that that teacher, teachers or anybody that can understand what a gun is, uh, understand the training that they need to have, uh, I'd have to think about what, what the issue or, or how they would be distributed or who would have them. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to vote, uh, or I would vote today against that, but, but to tell you the truth, uh, anybody picking up a gun or just to uh, suggest that they're a teacher and they need to be, that's wrong. But you're not opposed to that possibly if in the future depending upon the... With the proper training, I, I, I think there would have to be a, a, a significant kind of road map to being, uh, that being acceptable. So no, I'm not uh, categorically opposed to that, but I... I I struggle with the implementation because I've been I've been a proud uh, hunter uh, and gun owner um, since a long time ago, uh, and uh, I've taught gun safety to my family, to my wife, my son, uh, and. Um, I understand the implications or the dangers uh, revolving around firearms, but I also understand that it's not the firearm uh, that's the issue. So should there be anything that's outlawed, like a bump stop? Right now it's outlawed. Mm -hmm. It already is. Uh, and it's outlawed based on the fact that it's, it, it produces an automatic type of weapon that have been outlawed. So fully automatic firearms are against the law. There's no question about that. Right now, there's. You a, agree with that? That they share? Sure. Yes, and, it, and it's that's settled law. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, there's an initiative, I 1639, sure. that would um, uh, essentially categorize some of the uh, firearms I've had since I've been 12 as an assault rifle. Uh, and and uh, I struggle with the nomenclature. I don't think that's appropriate. Other aspects of the initiative, I believe, are wrong. Uh, but that being said, I I, uh, I do believe there is some settled law on on an automatic sense, and so there is some pieces of firearms that produce a fully automatic weapon that shouldn't be allowed. In the legislature, would uh, you support uh, limits on assault-style weapons or? What's an assault-style what, weapon? What, however you guys want to define it. Well, see, it's that's the what AR-15. Well, the AR-15 is only a weapon, and it's only designated assault because it looks different. It has okay, plastic would, would, pieces. Would it has a magazine. Would you support a ban on that? Would, no. Would, would you support reinstating the federal ban that was in place for a decade? No. Okay. Uh, I have not. No. Okay. Um, Kathy, what are your thoughts on 1639? Uh, first off, do you think we have a gun violence problem in this country? Um, I, I do think we have a gun violence problem. I think we have a lot of um, dead American citizens or injured American citizens that points to, uh, you know, the idea that we do have a problem with violence um, from people using guns in that violence. So I understand and agree that the gun doesn't go off by itself. Um, but certainly I think we have uh, an opportunity to do much better to keep people safe and while respecting the rights of responsible gun owners. I think that responsible gun owners um, probably cringe each and every time one of these incidents happens uh, because they get lumped in with people who 
have inappropriate access to guns and are using them for um, a purpose that a responsible gun owner would never, never consider. You, what do you think about 1639? So I think there are a lot of elements to like in 1639. I think the Alliance for Gun Responsibility has done a great job over the last you know, four to six years bringing initiatives to uh, people in the state of Washington that citizens support. In fact, the last two initiatives, both four years ago and two years ago, um, the majority of citizens in the 18th district approved of. And I think that's because they see those largely as um, common sense approaches to minimizing gun violence while honoring the absolute right of every uh, Washington citizen, you know, as long as they're law-abiding and, and responsible, to have a gun. Uh, so uh, I think the, legis the voters are going to look favorably upon this initiative, and I think that um, I support it. Now, if, what about, Larry, let's say that if 1639, if it were passed by a majority of voters in the 18th, and I don't know if it will or won't, but hypothetically, it won't. Would, would that, let's say it did, would that alter how you approach your job in the legislature? How far would you go to follow the will of your constituents versus your own personal beliefs? Well, that's a, uh, that is hypothetical. Well, on top of it being hypothetical, it has far reaching implications. Sure. Uh, a legislature has to listen to the district, uh, and if indeed the, the, the district voted for me to stand on my head 12 hours a day, I'd have to do that. Uh, I wouldn't care for that, but that would be their direction. And the same with 1639. If indeed the district uh, votes in favor of that, uh, and, and actually, if it becomes law, it becomes law. I mean, there's no question about that. But if the district votes for that, first of all, I'd be, I'd be shocked. Uh, but secondly, I, uh, um, I would have to abide by that, obviously, uh, and, and honor their wishes. Right, but would that help inform you on other votes related to the same issue? It would certainly help inform me on other votes, whether or not it, it actually changed my, uh, my core beliefs sure it was. You know, I think, um, you know, in the end what we're looking for are policies that take us closer to what we want. And so from my point of view, we want to honor the rights of Washington citizens to own guns. And we want to honor my right to uh, come to my place of business, my house of worship, the movie theater, my school, and come home in one piece at the end of that day. Uh, 1639 wants to put semi-automatic rifles on the same footing as pistols in this state so that instead of me being able to buy a semi-automatic rifle at the age of 18, whereas I couldn't buy a revolver or a pistol, pistol may not be the right word, um, I have to wait till I'm 21. And so I think that's a reasonable uh, move. Um, it also says that if I am a gun owner and I have a loaded weapon at home that I fail to secure, my child picks up this gun and harms uh, my other child or maybe a neighbor's child or, or something, um, that I have a responsibility there. And I think that responsible gun owners absolutely believe that they are responsible for their gun. Um, and most of them, large majority of them keep them out of the hands of people who have no business having that weapon. So we have lots of examples, unfortunately, of um, both people who are in despair, uh, seeking to end their own life, gaining access to a weapon that is not their weapon, that's available for their use and ending their life. And in fact, Washington leads the country um, in suicide. And uh, it, it's almost the majority that are, um, you know, people use a gun to do that. So we, we want to minimize the opportunity to harm yourself with a, with a weapon. So I think that um, 
you know, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that Southwest Washington as a whole, in the 18th district specifically, the last two times they have had a chance to do what the legislature could not do, pass responsible gun legislation that honors gun owners and protects citizens, vulnerable citizens, people who are victims of domestic violence, um, people who are at risk of harming themselves. Southwest Washington has stepped up and said, we're all in. And they have approved it by majority. Um, and I just think they need an opportunity to weigh in on this. And I'm confident that they'll uh, make their best judgment. And I am satisfied with, with whatever they decide. Larry, you were going to say. Uh, you may want to change the subjects because this could be a long time. It could. <laughs> well, <laughs> one, so one more. Go but ahead. that aside, uh, I, uh, Kathy's point on the fact that if indeed uh, your firearm is used to harm someone, you would be responsible. There's no question about that. You are now. Uh, what 1639 does is almost mandate the fact that you have to lock these firearms up. Uh, that means if someone, if the ability for you to protect yourself uh, becomes minimized. It doesn't become eliminated, but it becomes minimized. You, you get to say, just a second, let me run to my vault, uh, open that up, and then protect myself and my family. Now, the, the point of, of responsible gun ownership that Kathy made is valid. You have to be a responsible gun owner. You have to take uh, care of where those guns are stored. But indeed, if, in the, if it's mandated that it's locked up, that's taking a vital protection away from you uh, and a right uh, indeed uh, to protect yourself. So. Not that I don't want to let us move on, but there is no uh, mandatory um, requirement that the gun be locked up. It, it only is in regard to being charged. Uh, if it wasn't locked up, you would be charged. It's a, it's a different kind of penalty. Uh, yeah, so if I've, got my, if I've got my loaded weapon at home, or here at the office, I don't know what your policy is. Um, as long as that weapon's secured, no problem. But if I drop it in the bathroom and it discharges and someone is injured, um, then someone's probably going to have a conversation with me. Now, I don't know what will result from that. It's, it, you know, it's not a fait accompli that I'll be hauled away in chains. Um, but I do think you know, we want to promote uh, responsible uh, gun ownership. We have too many people um, being harmed I think unintentionally many times and sometimes very intentionally. So we want to really promote that culture of I'm the sole person responsible for the safety of this weapon and the fact that it's it's not used in any inappropriate way. And I think, and thank you both. I think Larry brings up a good point. We could go on about this. It was a good topic. It's yeah. very thing is a robust discussion. Um, but we are going to move on. Um, Hey, Kathy, uh, do you believe in climate change? Do you believe that human activity is contributing to it? I do. Okay, so uh, in the legislature, what should we do about it? And you support 1631. So uh, to the first part of your question, I think it was back in 2009 or 2008, the current legislature at that time set some pretty, um, I think, um, aspirational goals for the state of Washington that by 2020, 2030, we would, you know, really be finishing up our transition to clean energy. And I think that was a, that was a good goal. I trust the wisdom of that uh, uh, legislature. And I think that uh, certainly in the last two biennia, there have been other steps made to try and make that promise that we made to Washington citizens come true. Um, my disappointment with the past initiative and this current initiative is that um, it seems to be like overly complicated. I mean, it's called something different, right? It's called a fee this time and not a tax. Um, but my main concern is uh, this bureaucracy that we're going to be creating, this 15-member <laughs> board you know, with a paid executive, uh, potentially billions of dollars of revenue that the legislature is only allowed to approve, I think, some people are saying as a package. So if they come with 15 projects, the legislature would need to approve that package instead of being able to single out 
these projects one by one. So I think that even though it's a fee instead of a tax, and that means the legislature can't use it for their pet projects, um, I still have a lot of questions about that. And I really wish that it was a cleaner proposal, uh, so to speak, so that, um, you know, taxpayers really understood the fee that they would be paying and what they can really expect. So at this point, you aren't sure how you personally will vote on 1631? I think personally, I'm not intending to vote on it. I mean, vote positively on it. Okay. And I want the legislature to step up and get the work done uh, that they haven't been able to do. I think that initiatives can sometimes um, be eked out by the thinnest of majorities and then picked apart by the legislature, especially if the ruling party didn't like that initiative. Uh, we saw that with the, um, you know, especially when there's no funding mechanism attached, like the COLA for teachers and other things. So the, the, the best solution is for the legislature to do its work, to have an incremental approach <coughs> with a future goal like we have now, and demonstrate to taxpayers that we're delivering on those results and we're making progress in the direction that we said, which is a better future for Washington State, a uh, more stable um, economy for Washington State, and you know, protection of our recreation industries and our tourism industries. I mean, there's a lot of uh, money that comes into the state of Washington to um, take part in our, in our beautiful state, all that we have to offer. We want to protect that. Larry, uh, start with, do you believe in climate change and you believe it's uh, exacerbated by human activity? I think the climate is changing regularly and I think God has a lot to do with that. I, I would imagine that there are implications on the, from the human side, I mean, the exhaust that cars emit or the coal-fired uh, power plants. Or, um, I'm not convinced that, it, uh, that Washington, uh, any changes here in Washington would dramatically improve that particular uh, impact on climate. Now, with that said, back to 1631, um, Like many initiatives, the title of these initiatives are what people vote on. Uh, the title of this initiative is the Protect Washington Act. Uh, I struggle with that in, in a, a bunch of different ways, but, but Kathy's observation of the fact that this initiative has no um, concrete um, kind of objectives. It gathers all this money, by the way, on the backs of taxpayers. The gas tax is going to go up. The, if you eat a popsicle that was delivered to you by a truck, the price of that popsicle is going to go up. I mean, your utility bill is going to go up. Uh, carbon emitters really have a have a uh, have a beneficial spot in society in a number of ways, and and in order to impose a fee or a tax or whatever indeed the legislature decides to call this. Um, it will become, it will come back on the backs of all of our taxpayers. If our citizens read 1631, it would die of its own weight. Uh, it is uh, a politically appointed 15 member board. Uh, and this board then appoints um, uh, other advisory groups uh, to guide it. Uh, and, and the and there are no objectives, really. There's no uh, 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 solutions that, that are identified or, and or um, at least taken a shot at. So I, uh, I don't think 1631 is the answer. I don't have a, I'm the biggest user of clean air and clean water uh, that, that I could possibly be. Uh, I spend my off times enjoying both. Uh, I love our environment. And if there's a way to keep it clean, we need to work on that. This isn't it. Um, tell me this, what is, in your mind, what's the biggest issue that we haven't touched on yet here? Go ahead, Larry. Anything stand out? Well, generally, uh, the, we hear often that we, we uh, it would be a benefit to change our tax structure. Uh, what do you think about that? 
I don't think we need to change our tax structure for a, a bunch of reasons. Number one is I don't think we have a revenue problem in the state. I, I'm excited to take a look at um, at agencies or, or different uh, spending centers in our government and see if indeed there's a way we can balance a budget from the from the expense side of the ledger as opposed to the always raising the revenue to balance a budget. So you don't think the legislature has done that in recent years? I don't think the legislature has done that in recent years. I think that's a it's a pretty easy thing to say that we're controlling costs. I think it takes somebody with a, a background in finance or somebody that has that uh, um, that innate desire to take a look at this. And there's a bunch of different budgeting principles. One is zero-based budgeting. If indeed we we operated that or placed a few of our agencies through that, uh, I would imagine we would see some ways to save some money. Do you think, are there any people in the legislature now who have a financial background or? Well, I'm not sure it, it takes a degree in accounting mm -hmm. um, or, you know, studying several years on budgeting processes. Uh, I think it takes a business background or a desire to simply understand that we're spending other people's money. Uh, and I don't, I don't suggest that's a partisan issue, um, but it, it does take um, concentrated effort on really thinking about what money we're spending. Uh, does a study for a half a million dollars make sense? Does another 1.5 million to, uh, to, you know, to examine the benefits of this process? Uh, we, we need to understand what goals there are, what, what money we're actually spending, and what, what uh, benefits we're achieving with those expenditures. Kathy, what is she we well, so I have two. Um, I have real concerns with um, our state's approach to mental health. Um, and of course, the Western States Hospital is a big topic and what are the solutions there. And then also with regard to the budget, um, I've been a big advocate since I ran in 2016 for uh, Washington joining the states in our country that use tax expenditure budgets. Um, that's an uh, initiative that's gaining a lot of support in the both the House and the legislature, I mean the uh, Senate. Um, so a tax expenditure budget would make an accounting of the 650 plus tax exemptions or deferrals or credits or loopholes that we have and just allow legislators to see um, as much as we possibly can what, what that's costing us. About 450 of those are discretionary. Um, the majority of them don't have any sunset, and they're really not reviewed on a um, frequent basis. And it, in fact, it passed through the Senate. The bill that I'm thinking of passed through the Senate, uh, I think, with, without any no votes. So I think the legislature is ready to look at those exemptions and say, are they connected to policy? Are they paying taxpayers back? And how often do we, do we you know, trust but verify, so to speak? Uh, right now, we have more revenue that we're saying no to than we're bringing, than we're utilizing. And that's okay as long as those exemptions are doing what I, I hope they were intended to do, which is strengthen the state of Washington. So we need to verify that. Um, with regard to the Western States Hospital, um, I agree with uh, one legislator said we need to go into special session. This is a crisis. Another, uh, Senator Braun, said we need $500 million in public bonds to build local community health facilities so that we can uh, remove patients from Western states that don't need to be there. We'd be better served in community um, mental health um, uh, facilities. You know, and the legislature's been spending a lot of money, um, you know, almost $300 million over the last few by any to try and shore that up. But they've had terrible turnover at the top with executives, just a revolving door in the last two and a half years. And uh, I think the people of Washington, especially our vulnerable citizens, deserve a lot better. And um, I think the state of Washington should be embarrassed. And I'm really happy to see people like Senator Braun and other legislators um, saying this is something we need to address immediately. It's not okay that people who need mental health services have to leave home 
and go to a place that's very dangerous for them to be there with no plan for how to transition them out. In fact, some people are staying there because there's nowhere for them to go. And I think that's horrifying. Uh, and we can do better. Thank you. Um, we'll move on now. It uh, gives you your final pitch why voters should support you. And uh, go ahead and mention any notable endorsements, if you like. And we'll start with Larry. Uh, notable endorsements. Huh? I welcome you to uh, visit my website, the Association of Washington Businesses, uh, Building Industry Association, um, Northwest Credit Union Association. Uh, there's quite a few um, business-oriented associations, um, outdoors uh, groups. Uh, more of my notable endorsements, I, I, I believe, come from individuals. And, and, uh, our Congresswoman has endorsed uh, our campaign, our Secretary of State has. So I, I'm proud of those, uh, and yet I'm, I'm more excited to get the endorsements of our citizens and, and looking forward to that. Um, so why elect me? Uh, I believe that the legislature needs a businessman. It needs, it needs my 35 years of of business experience. It needs my 35 years of sitting with small businesses and, and uh, working with them uh, as they struggle with with regulations that impede their success or, or uh, struggle with regulations that enhance them. I've worked all of my career helping people. Uh, when I retired it was just a void that I had and uh, and see that as a need uh, or as a benefit uh, in Olympia. As the CEO of a business, that uh, you really have the responsibility, you guys know, of, of the families that work here. Uh, you have to have a, uh, uh, a positive uh, uh, ability to forecast uh, some of the storms that come through. Um, you have and if indeed you didn't forecast the storm, you have to understand how to dance in the rain. Uh, so it's it's critical that that you have that or you, that you have that ability, and, and that ability I can take to Olympia. On top of that, we had we have eighty thousand members at the last credit union I served, uh, and all of them depended on us for some part of their financial well-being. I can take that that uh, experience uh, and uh, uh, an understanding of, of creating budgets and adjusting budgets and making sure that, that we stay within our means to Olympia. Great. Well, thank you very much. Kathy? Uh, so as far as endorsements go, I would say that we have a very broad range of um, you know, regular people, uh, firefighters, teachers, um, working adults, members of labor, um, nurses, groups like that. And so they're all at electgillespie.org. Um, and I think that we have a broad spectrum of community community leaders from throughout the 18th district. So elected officials all the way from Washington to the center. And I think that um, certainly, the endorsements that I'm most proud of would be, you know, our primary results. I think that the reason that I go door to door as much as I do is because I really think that um, if you want to work for the people, you need to go to the doorstep and make your case and uh, listen, listen to their needs, even when they say you are not the person who can elect me. And what I always say in response, I mean, you're not the person who can represent me because you're of a different political party. And what I always say is. I remind them that my school board service was nonpartisan. So what did we learn? We learned how to solve problems. We learned how to demonstrate value, how to deliver tangible results, and how, how to show up and listen, and then try and represent the community. And so uh, my pledge to them is that regardless of whether they vote or whether they voted for me or whether they know anything about the issues or agree with me on anything, that. Um, when they come to me, I'm there for them, just like I was uh, in the school district. So I think that kind of training is very good when we think about 
um, the hyperpartisan situation that we're in right now, where I can't work with you because you look different, talk, act different from me, you have different ideas than me, but the job is for the two of us to work together to solve problems. And so I think I've got that great experience. Um, you know, my former career was as a newspaper editor and reporter. I never had the privilege of working here, and I am not related to Katie Gillespie, who does work here, uh, even though we get asked that all the time. But I bring that up because what that taught me was to meet people where they are, to get the facts right, and to understand how to work around people who don't want me to have the facts and the information, uh, people who want to keep things in the dark, people who want to um, put out their set of facts in order to pressure someone to make a bad decision. And so I know how to ask the right questions. I believe in transparency. Um, certainly as a school board director, I've operated with complete transparency. Um, and had to use those levers of transparency myself as an elected public official. I've actually had to file public records requests myself. Uh, that's how entrenched sometimes those gatekeepers are. And of course, you know, the Public Records Act says that people don't see their right to know to any, any. And of course I believe in that. So um, I think we have some great work to do. Uh, this type of work really energizes me. I think I've learned a lot I've, as a school board director, and I think that, uh, you know, all things being equal, that the state legislature is not really an entry-level job. I think that we want people who have experience in representing people, in public policy work, in, uh, you know, showing back up to explain the decision that might not be popular, um, and to hear that you might have been wrong, and how do you account, be accountable to the people and say, I, I, I did make a mistake, and here's, here's how we're going to fix that. Um, you know, so my job is to uh, bring uh, citizens along with me to make sure they have the information that I have, that they have um, easy ways to weigh in on discussions. I'm in favor of remote testimony and all these things. I think it's ridiculous that people have to take a half day off of work or longer to, for a 30 second or two minute snippet in the state legislature. I think they should be able to weigh in uh, easier. Um, so, you know, I think the voters are going to get someone with energy, someone with experience, and someone who knows how to get things done. And so I'm, I'm just chomping at the bit, ready to give them what they want. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you so much.